This is Art History 1, Part 11. Uh, this is the, the continuation of the early medieval and uh, on into the Romanesque. The next work is called the, the Giro Crucifix. It is from the area of Europe that uh, later was to become Germany and Austria. Uh, the, the rulers at the time uh, of this, uh, you know, around 1000 or so AD, um, they, they aspired to be emperors like uh, the Roman emperors, but you know they had the, the sanctioning of the by, by the popes uh, to be to be emperors, uh, but they never did get so far as to to resurrect the Roman Empire. But they did make works of art that did have some you know characteristics of the Roman things and or, or from classical antiquity, and as 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 many of the things made during the Middle Ages. Uh, is this a kind of a composite of the different styles that, that we've been looking at, uh, including the what comes from classical antiquity, what comes from Byzantine art, what comes from the um, indigenous art of the population of Northern Europe, which was the portable uh, jewelry kind of things that we looked at from the Sutton Hoo find. Being uh, where it is in, in uh, in Europe, it's sort of in between uh, the East and the West. It's much closer to the Byzantine, so it does have some Byzantine characteristics. What we have is a, a, a life-size wooden figure of Christ on a cross. And we've seen this before in a, in a mosaic. Here's the, the mosaic that we saw before. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's definitely Byzantine, and it has those Byzantine features of uh, sort of doll-like figures uh, stylized, flat, the, sty the drapery is stylized, and uh, uh, it has gold. So with those characteristics in mind, it, this has that. It's, it is stylized to a certain extent, if you, if you, especially if you look at the, the loincloth uh, around Christ's waist here and compare that to the loincloth here, it's very similar. It's almost, it, almost identical, the little knot right here and the little pleats, the, the stylization of the folds are all very similar, and and this is the way loincloths were made uh, for crucifixes for you know ten centuries. So it is a very common thing. Uh, this degree of stylization, though, having a a wooden a full size wooden figure is not really, is not a, a normal medieval thing. They didn't they didn't make a lot of full size sculpture, especially in, in early medieval period. Uh, that wasn't part of architecture. Um, so in itself, being being a large sculpture, a figural sculpture, uh, you know, makes it something that has a, a, a you know a characteristic of, of classical antiquity. But the type of, of of crucifix that it is, if you compare it once again to the uh, the model we're looking at from the Byzantine, uh, there, there's two basic ways of making of representing Christ on the cross. One is a, the heroic Christ, which is what this one is, where Christ is, what, what is being emphasized here is the triumph over death aspect, where Christ doesn't look dead. He looks alive and triumphant. He holds his arms up, and um, the, uh, the pain and suffering aspect is, is, is minimized. The other way is to emphasize the pain and the suffering. And the people who were later going to be uh, the Germans, uh, they, will, they will do this to, to a much greater extent even than this. But as we see here, this, this Christ looks dead. He is more affected by gravity, hanging down, head bowed down, eyes closed. And, and there's a, just a kind of a you know, corpse-like look, look to, the, to the figure. So and, you know the distortions in the feet too, the the nails, the emphasis you know on on, on the suffering, on the dead Christ also is is the purpose of it is to show the sacrifice and to um, make the viewer more empathetic. The way the figure is rendered, um, when we look at the way it might have been rendered, say if it were done by somebody from classical antiquity, assuming they would. Uh, were to do this subject, you know, it, it doesn't have nearly the degree of naturalism that you would expect 
from something uh, something that was classical. Uh, the the artist doesn't appear to understand anatomy so much. Uh, the 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 arms kind of look like conical shapes. There's hardly any indication, like just a tiny bit here, of where the where the elbow would be uh, in the in the the divisions of the muscles here, and the you know the, where where there ought to be a sort of a lump where the deltoid muscle is, for example. It's just a straight straight shot all the way to the wrist, and um, so so we're not looking at something that has the same degree of naturalism. It's much far farther removed. Uh, the proportions, however, you know, are pretty classical, not, 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 not that far removed. It doesn't have the, the big doll-like head. But when we look at, the say, the, how the anatomy, the surface anatomy here, the, the division between the, 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 the stomach area and the, and the rib cage is kind of a line there. It's kind of a groove indicating the separate sections of the body, similar to the way it is rendered in, in a mosaic here, or, or any other representation uh, that, that is, is Byzantine, that sections of the body are sort of linearly separated. And this isn't a sculpture. You can imagine a sculptor up at this time making something along these lines would come up with something similar to this solution. And the way the drapery is rendered as, as, as straight, pleated, uh, 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 patternized uh, forms, is is also a you know a Byzantine like thing. It has a kind of a a, 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 a gritty reality to it compared to the the b prettiness of, of Byzantine things. You know, the Byzantines type tend to make things more decorate, decorated and and you know splendid. With, with the gold and the shining and, and to make it look otherworldly, uh, to make it look like a spiritual thing and to put someone in the sort of mood to be, um, you know, to commune with, with, with God using, using the art as a, uh, you know, a, um, a way of sort of getting, getting you in the mood to, to, to pray. Anyway, the, uh, this is doing it a similar thing, but in a different way. Something that that shows you sort of the, the the rawness of the of the event, rather than the heroism of the event. The uh, other otherwise the uh, uh, the rest of the sculpture includes the cross, which is very plain. Very has no ornament in it. You can imagine, you know, if it were actually uh, Byzantine, it would the, there would be some sort of patterning here. There would be lots of things to indicate. They wanted to add extra specialness to it, so being plain is is removed from that. It has a halo here, and the halo is part of the the uh, is is part of the the cross rather than being part of of Christ's head. And it has jewels on it, just a little bit of sparkle, but you know not nearly so much as what you expect from things like you know Byzantine things. The next work we're going to look at is also from this period, but it's it, and it's made in a kind of a uh, in an attempt to bring back classical antiquity a, a little bit by making uh, uh, large bronze doors for a church. Um, the Romans made large bronze doors for their temples, like uh, the the Pantheon would have that, and when they made the old St. Peter's, they, they use large bronze doors as, as sort of an imitation of antiquity. So in this era, this uh, early medieval period where the emperors are trying to trying to bring that back, they're making another uh, large bronze door. And this is done, you know, technologically like the Romans would have done it with the lost wax method. It's done each, each side, I expect, or done with uh, a single pour and uh, it's a very difficult thing to do, and, and it's, it is, you know, I'm sure it's a very expensive thing to do. But what we're going to look at is the style that they use is anything but classical. It is that as far removed from, from classical art as, as you can imagine. Um, when you look in your book, you'll see how the, the different panels are separated into stories. There's Old Testament stories on one side and New Testament stories on the right, and they are matched one to another, sort of related thematically.
Well, we're going to look at it, just one of them, to see how figures are rendered. First of all, the format is not perfectly straight lines, like ruled line, like you would expect in, in something that was classical. It is it looks like they're hand drawn lines, drawn in clay, and and it's and they're they're just you know they're not perfectly straight, and you would expect something to be perfectly straight if it were done to match a Roman thing. What's being matched that is Roman here is just the fact that it's bronze and it's large, and it's done you know technically like like the Romans, but stylistically. It's, it's just, this is, is far away, far removed from the way, the way figures look in classical sculpture of any kind, whether bronze or, or, or marble. These figures are the doll-like figures, you think, that come from, from Byzantine art. Uh, this is uh, God the Father in the, the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve at the time when, uh, after Adam and Eve have, have taken the, the fruit of the tree, and uh, God is sort of accusing them by leaning forward a little bit, pointing his finger, and you follow the finger line. It goes to, to Adam first, and Adam bending over, not looking at, at God, covering himself up with his fig leaf, is sort of uh, sneakily pointing to Eve by, by hiding his hand from her underneath his arm, uh, to Eve over here, who's doing the same gesture, but pointing... Uh, uh, her, pointing her finger down at the at the at the uh, serpent down here, represented like a little a little dragon. You can see it has wings. Its mouth is open, and you know three tongues are sticking out. It has a little coily coily tail and two legs. There's a, a scene is is represented with a, a a representation of the tree this way. And the and some little decoration over here, but otherwise you see the surface is um, is 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 devoid of any decoration to indicate stuff. You know, it's it's not like the the Byzantine art where things are are filled with all sorts of patterns. It wants to um, emphasize the story aspect uh, and and de-emphasize the decoration aspect. They even, they even didn't, didn't even smooth out the clay. Originally, you know, when you make bronze, you have to first make, a, make the things out of clay, and that's not even made smooth. It still has a rough texture to it, the way a big slab of clay would have. And the figures look like they were just like handmade, uh, you know, figures that are stuck on. They, they, they stick out so much from the surface. Um, the style of the figures, especially, you know, uh, God the Father here is... is you know, has the doll-like proportions, large head, little little body, this sort of stringy, and it's sort of floating in the air. There's no indication of, of space, or that you know they're in any, any place at all. It's just it's just sort of hanging in the air, uh, feet sort of dangling. Uh, we've seen this many times. The the way the the drapery fits over the body is with these little lines to indicate some patterns, rather than flowing the way actually cloth, uh, cloth moves. There's the proportion of the head with the body, but also the, the you know, little bitty arms, too, and holding a book here, and this gesture is just an unmistakable gesture. It's this leaning forward, and the, and the gesture, and the, this, this, the way the, the eye line is really fixed, is the, the whole emphasis is not on, on the way things actually look, but almost like a caricature of this accu accusation that is being made, and our eyes just follow this line and follow this line and follow to the to, to Eve here and and down to the serpent. Even the even the little uh, branch of this tree is pointing in that direction. So everything is is all the extraneous details are brought to a minimum, so as to. Um, to get just the story being told in the in the most stark manner, the, there is nothing at all heroic about the nudity of of either of the figures. They look as as shameful as they possibly can. In fact, deliberately even more shameful looking than than the figure figure of God, who's who's clothed. But even so, this the, the figure of God has a normal sort of or a relatively normal sort of body, whereas these you know are almost just lumps. 
with with you know tiny little stringy arms that's, and legs that stick out, uh, because the whole point of the story has to do with their shame, and this is a a kind of a a story that anyone can easily read, not just uh, to tell what is happening, uh, the actions that are happening, but the feelings that are going with this. I mean, everyone understands the concept of shame, and this is illustrated as, as clearly as it could be illustrated by anyone in any means, medium. And uh, uh, if if this were, you know, more classical, say, if the figures had classical proportions or if this was rendered in some way classical, it just, it would be the wrong language to say this story in because classical things are, the emphasis is on, on the heroic and, you know, human beings at their best. And this, this, this would not be the right language to, to tell this story in. So, you know, in, at least in this case, this is having this stylized manner, having the little doll-like figures is the best possible uh, way of telling this story. And we look back at the, at the whole thing. All of the figures are all like that. They're like the little doll-like figures that are telling little stories throughout the thing, and they're all doing it in this sort of stark, um, minimal manner. Here's another uh, version, or another way that it's lit, so you can see, see more clearly uh, the absence of any kind, anything that's decorative. In a, in a way that makes this almost, you know, look, look like a stage play almost with a minimal uh, setting. All right, so let's like look at an example from uh, manuscript illumination from this period. Also, is you know has has a mixture of things to it. Uh, this is Christ uh, washing the feet of the disciples. A scene that occurs in the uh, uh, right after the Last Supper, where Christ says he's going to wash wash the feet of the disciples. This is Christ in the center, uh, reaching out sort of in a blessing gesture towards towards uh, Saint Peter, who is seated with one foot in the basin of water, and he is in the story. He's he's reluctant to have his feet washed because he feels he should be washing Christ's feet, and Christ says, you know, let him let him let him let him do this. So. The, so that's the story being told, and the story is being told mainly between these two figures. Uh, the rest of the figures of the of the um, the disciples are in the background, shown as you know one partial figure here with a bunch of heads to indicate uh, the crowd, and another you know one holding a basin, and another about to, you know, taking off his sandals. Like he's going to get, he's going to be next, uh, and they're they're standing in this is in front of these two columns with capitals, and there's a, a kind of an architectural rendering up here. And this area here is just solid gold. It's gold leaf being that have been applied to the applied to the surface, so it's a big shiny thing making a uh, making a uh, uh, a big Byzantine sort of decoration. Uh, let's look at the let's get the style. First of the figures, we see the figures are are stylized greatly. The 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 way figures are the the modeling of the figures is made such that the light and the dark uh, to indicate volume doesn't seem to correspond to actual um, three dimensional shapes in space. Um, this little dark line here, I guess, is the pad inside the palm, and the, has a dark thing and a light thing to indicate volume. And there's other things that indicate volume in different places. Even here, this little swirl on the knee, it is as if the the person making this uh, is unaware of of what these are for, the dark and the light. It's it's just a surface pattern that they're applying, without regard to what these actually represent. I mean, even down to like the weirdness of the shape of this leg that's dipped in the uh, basin. Um, this looks like a, a knee in the bottom of a leg, but this dip here doesn't seem to correspond to any part of a human anatomy. This, it's, you would think that the person's not even aware that people have thighs that, that ought to go bridge the gap between here and here. It's kind of strangely distorted. 
But you have to remember that the, the artists who are making these kinds of images want to remove them from reality, that they're telling these stories that uh, are from the Bible, but there are spiritual people and spiritual events occurring that they want to remove them from regular reality. And that's the reason to have a style like this, is to, to make them... Um, to, to make them not everyday life, that you can, that are, are not, uh, not so much like, like the real world. If you look at these eyes, little beady eyes with the um, parentheses on either side of the eyes, that's, that's kind of a, a, a Byzantine thing as well. We've seen that before in, in mosaics, especially like the Justinian mosaic, and it ultimately goes back to the Tetrarch style. And this being you know, made in an area of, 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 of Europe closer to Byzantine, they would have had access to imagery of that style. Look at the uh, uh, seat that Peter is sitting on. We've seen this sort of thing before in the Lindisfarne Gospel, where the artist is, is taking something that went back sometime in the past to something that was made in, in space to indicate um, an object in space. It, it sort of turns a corner here. Uh, but this artist is is using those forms and those shapes without any regard to what what shape they make or how they ought to be appear in space because he's not thinking of space at all. The the figures are are floating above a surface without indication of weight. The the shape of the body, the sort of sway, is you know may go back ultimately to contrapposto, but there's not really any you know contrapposto involves having weight on one leg and not on the other, and there's no indication of that. It's just flat patterns and different ways of rep rendering pattern of, of cloth. And, and if you look at, you know, even in the cloth, how the, the, the light and shadow doesn't seem to correspond re regularly with things in space. Let's look at the architecture up here. Um, again, we, it is as though the, the artist is not, not aware of what he's doing in terms of what these things represent in space. I mean, this, if you look at just this building by itself, it has a, a front, front and it recedes back with a roof and a, and a side here. Uh, and I guess there's two of them symmetrically arranged and there's a, a courtyard between with a wall. But this image looks like it's probably a wall that's maybe in front, but it's, 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 it's a surface here and then it goes straight down or, or what? I mean, what, how is this spatially related to this? And then this wall here and then this roof are also kind of weirdly related. Like it, uh, in, in the real world, what does this actually represent? And it's, it becomes uh, unclear and, and difficult to, to reason out because the artist is, is just using forms as surface patterns without regard. To how they actually exist in space. He's just making things up. So as to make a decorative pattern up here to be something to frame the figure of Christ in this with this halo right in its center and uh, telling this story using using the means of something to, to bring it out of the real world and into uh, the world of, of spiritual things. Here's another example from the same book. It's called the uh, Gospel of Otto the Third. I mean, you can, it has another figure. This this has come uh, from the, a seated emperor. The image of the of the emperor from uh, you know, like say the Art of Constantine or 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 other Tetrarch type style things. Um, I think the the that Junius Bassus sarcophagus that we saw had a Christ sitting in this pose, uh, but it's been so far removed from that that it's become a pattern. Uh, of just another thing that, that can be used to um, to have a one of the gospel writers. This would be Luke uh, represented. Okay, let's look at uh, the next phase. After one thousand, we go into the Romanesque phase, and in the Romanesque, what we're going to be looking at is, is you know first in architecture and how the architecture changed. Romanesque, by the way, means like the Romans, but it's not exactly like the Romans. It just has some qualities. We'll get, get, deal with the what qualities it has that are different from what happened before. Let's look real quick. This is the kind of church that was before the Romanesque. Uh, this is m much, much earlier. It has an emphasis on this wall, which is, which is 
flat and unarticulated. It has a flat ceiling. Flat ceilings were a problem because of fires. They were made of wood, and in order to have something other than a flat ceiling, uh, you would have to, uh, or something other than wood, it has, has to be something other than flat, because uh, only wood would be able to span this distance and, and, and not sag down, uh, but wood is vulnerable to fire. So in order to, to not have a flat ceiling or not have something vulnerable to fire, you, you may, they made barrel vaulted ceilings out of masonry. And this was, you know, went a long way to keep, keep from burning down churches, or at least, you know, from that source of fire. Another thing they did is they did a different kind of articulation of the wall. If you're going to have a barrel vault up here, then you have the opportunity to do uh, to, to change the shapes of the wall, to make it much more interesting, to have a composition of the wall um, that has a different rhythm going down the, the, the nave. The arcade, what used to be an arcade, has come to be much, much higher than before. It's articulated with Roman kind of capitals here. And then it's got you know, Roman arches here. And it's divided into two different zones. A, uh, uh, this first arch zone, the aisles, uh, you know, is articulated by this line, but it's divided up into in these other parts with these vertical lines. And there's a section up here, which is the, the gallery section, which corresponds to what would be the roof of this uh, aisle on this side. It's, uh, what it does is it divides the, the nave into, into these sections, these um, uh, called bays. Each one of these things represents a bay, and if you look at the, the ground plan, it's divided into these sections here. This each these represent each of the piers that we see, and the piers are it's kind of hard to see here, but they're squares with semicircular forms. Go back to here. Uh, there's a square pier inside there with semicircular um, or semi-cylindrical forms of the columns on each face, and though on the inner face, where there's, a, where there's an arch over here, uh, it stops here at the, at the springing point of the arch, or just below the springing port, point of the arch, with a capital. But the one on the inner face, on the aisle side, or on the nave side, continues up and goes all the way around, and you can see it goes all the way around to the, uh, to the other side, in what's called a transverse arch. And, and so you see that the different forms of the architecture are telling you what they're doing. Like the one on this inner side is going all the way around, while the one on the inner side here is going around this arch. So that the forms continue. They're using these forms as a way sort of to tell you the structure of, 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 of everything that's in the, in the building. It's a sequence of arches. The wall is divided into openings. And up here we have a, a similar sort of thing going on with two smaller arches, and each one of those has a colonnette in front of it, and it's recessed, and all of the four architectural forms has a kind of a, a rationale for it. You know, everything is, uh, everything of a different um, purpose has a different form, so that, so that everything relates as, as, a, as a composition, not nearly as sophisticated in the, in the, in the time before. Uh, but one downside that you have here is that there's not nearly as much light. And Romanesque is characterized by being, you know, their churches are kind of dark. The, 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 uh, the masonry of the, of the walls tend to be kind of heavy and emphasis on the structure of the wall and, and they, they have a, a fortress-like character. In fact, when you think of fortresses, when you think of castles and the crenellated castles, those, those things that in your mind's eye of, of what, what makes up a castle, that's the Romanesque style as well. We'll get away from that when we move to, go to the Gothic style, and when I, you know, show you the, the Gothic style and show you how it, it changed, then we can see more clearly what is characterizing this Romanesque style. Because um, here it seems to be very lofty, very light, but that's that's because of the way this is photographed with lights. But normally it's very dark, and and when we get to the the, the Gothic, the emphasis will be on less wall and more light.
but um, for now, let's just look at this as you know, a, a kind of an an improvement, or at least a a, a, a moving forward on a uh, moving in the direction of what's going to be Gothic later from the the pre-Romanesque period. Here, looking through the front door or portal uh, at the uh, uh, at the nave, and you can see what the aisle looks like. And you see a little bit there what the aisle. Here's another picture here. You can see that in the aisle instead of having a flat ceiling e either, it also has uh, vaulting. But this vaulting has an intersection of the cylinder, which is the cylinder or semi-cylinder of the barrel vault going this way, and this and other barrel vaults sort of going this way through space. So they intersect in what's called a growing vault. Um, later, we're going to see how arches here are going to become growing vaults uh, in the in the ceiling, but this early Romanesque, they don't have that yet. It's just um, a, a half of a cylinder on top of the on top of the nave. Here it is again. You can these are artificially lit, uh, so you can see the different forms for this photograph. But it, it, originally, there's only going to be light coming mostly from here. If we look at back at that first photo. Uh, you can, you see light coming from here, and it's mostly dark up here. There's no light coming from here. This is this is the what's behind here is the roof of the of the of the aisle, and you can see in the aisle there's a there's a, a window here, but there's not a window in every one of the bays, so there's not much light hardly at all coming from the from the aisles. Another thing about these Romanesque churches is the uh, the popularity. That occurred for uh, for pilgrimages. This is a pilgrimage church, and uh, this is this the one that we're looking at is called um, Santiago de Compostela, and it's in Spain, in the, uh, the the sort of northwestern part of Spain, on the coast. And it was the uh, the goal of many pilgrimages, um, pilgrimages that they may have gone, you know. Hundred miles or, or more from from where these where the people lived who went on these pilgrimages, they would they would go across the land and on foot, on on roads, and uh, they would seek out these places. Especially this would be one of the biggest ones, and then the bigger than this would be Rome, and then the, if you wanted to go the extra special uh, pilgrimage, that would be all the way to Jerusalem. But what they would do is they would they were they were they were Christians. They wanted to go and venerate saints and, and the, the relics of saints that would be in these churches. And all along the way, people would spring up little towns and, and uh, add chapels here and there, so that uh, on the way you could you could see more stuff. And so, they, just as when people go to Disneyland now, if you go on the road to Disneyland, there's you know, any number of stops on the way to to um, you know. You know, for people to get get more money out of the tourists, because these are these are a pilgrim is very much like a tourist. But they would the the design of the church is affected by the fact that is that the the pilgrims are going to come here. People from from the town, you know, come from one side. They will go in the church and, and the transept over here, uh, and the people from the uh, the pilgrims would come through another. And the design of the church is such that. You, once you, you make a little pilgrimage inside the church, you would come around and go all the way around the building. And they would add, as you get to the, the, the top end here, the, the eastern end, all these little extra apses, you know, just one isn't enough. Because then you can have multiple altars with multiple places to have relics. And, these, uh, and you go all the way around here. You know, while services are held for the locals in this part, um, the pilgrims can go around the, the circumference, and as we'll see in the future, uh, churches that, that emphasize even greater this aspect, there will be more and more of these little lumps, these, these absidials, or the little lapses as you go around, so as to have more places to venerate, to, uh, to make it a, a greater draw for more pilgrims to come to. Here's what it looks like on the outside as a drawing. I don't think this this church doesn't look like that anymore, but it's uh, this is what it originally looked like with these little absidials here, uh, and you would come in from this side, and they would you'd only come in from the the main door here on special occasions, feast days, and things. 
So that's a that's a uh, uh, a pilgrimage church, and this is one of the earlier ones and one of the biggest ones that, that people would go to. And as we see when we get to the Gothic, that that how this evolves even farther in this same direction. Uh, notice one thing I didn't mention is also the, the nave as we saw before of the of the normal basilican structure. You know, it's just you know you have the big open space here in the middle with aisles on either side with a colonnade, but unlike the original uh, Christian churches from the from early Christian times, like say St. Peter's, the first St. Peter's, um, we just had a minimal transept. Here the transept is huge. It, it's as if it were just a, a copy of the church again going crossways. And, and it's, and it, you know, the, the way this is articulated with bays, uh, as we saw in the photographs of the interior, it's just the same as if it were the, the church again going this way, but changed in directions. It's so as to give more space up here for more people, more, more pilgrims, and, and give them something to do so that they don't cross over and, and interfere stuff going on in the middle part. They can just go around the perimeter. And if you're going to have a perimeter, then you have to have this wider uh, than you would have ordinarily in the, in the older styles of churches. You know, if you look back over here, this one, I don't know if it even has a transept, and some of them don't, or if they do, it's just a, a minimal thing going going left and right over here. But we'll see how this goes later when, later when we get to the, uh, the Romanesque. Here's a, a couple of pictures from Harry Potter to show you this is what Romanesque looks like, uh, you know, in, in things that aren't churches. There, this, this emphasis on the walls, very small windows, uh, the, these sort of extended uh, corbels is, you know, when you have something that's up above that's bigger than the thing below, you have to have a corbel to pull out to, so that it has something to rest upon. And the, that's a, a feature they emphasize a lot in, in this sort of pretend architecture to look like uh, something from that, from that period. All right, let's look at sculpture. Uh, Romanesque sculpture. This is in the in, it's in Spain. It's in the interior of a of a uh, uh, a cloister. As you can see, we've seen a cloister before. It has a, a row of columns. And I remember when I talked about rows of columns, that the 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 forces of the that's coming down and pushing down on these columns, or on these I'm sorry, uh, arches, um, pushing down on the on the arches spreads out to the left and right, uh, but they they cancel each other out during the course of the of the arcade, but when you get to the end, you have to have a huge mass. And that's why this is here. Um, we're going to be looking at one of the sculptures that is in the corner. Here's some of the a crucifix here and, and other things, but the one we're going to look at is called uh, Christ on the, on the Journey to Emmaus. In this, um, you have three figures, and they're large, sort of monumental-looking figures. Let's look at another image of it here. It's a little, little sharper. Um, they're uh, in relief. You see the two figures here are, are uh, disciples of Christ. And, and this is Christ here, standing, with his cruciform halo. And all three of them sort of sort of moving to the right. You know, the one on here is a little bit moving to the right. You can see his, his hips are, are sort of at a three-quarter angle, I guess you could imagine them, underneath the clothes. Uh, his feet sort of indicate the, the movement to the right. This one seems to be walking forward. This, this leg is in front of this leg, uh, even though it projects the same amount. You can sort of imagine that underneath the clo clothes here, that's what those legs are doing. So it's moving to the right. But Christ here is standing, and he's in the just as is he's stopping and turning back to go the other way. So his leg is in this awkward position to be twisted around as if he's arresting the motion going to the right. Um, it's that, that motion is emphasized in these the forms of these, these lines going diagonally to the right, and then this one going counter to it. Uh, here's another one going to the, to the right. Um, so, the, so formally, what's going on is motion is moving here and then it's stopping here. So what happens in the story is that Christ, after his uh, resurrection, is, you know, shows himself to uh, a couple of disciples, but, he, but he, they don't recognize him at first. 
and and as the story goes, he he, he they do recognize him at some point, and so the uh, when I guess when they get to Emmaus and when they have supper there, uh, he ra they he shows himself and to be Christ, and they they they're all surprised and he disappears. But the point of this image is to show Christ and these two disciples as if they were pilgrims. Before, we, because this is the time when pilgrimages became very, very popular, and there's a little detail here. It's kind of hard to see, but Christ is is carrying this this satchel, and on the satchel is a, is a seashell. Well, that that is a, a symbol for pilgrims because that uh, the church we were just talking about in in Spain uh, is on the coast, and people who went all the way down to that church, when they got to the coast, they would go to the beach and get a get a, a shell. And they would take it with them back and show everybody here. I, I went all the way to the, you know, to that to that um, pilgrimage spot, and this is my symbol. Well, Christ is is dressed as if he were a uh, a pilgrim, the kind of this you know pilgrims walk. That's what they're doing in the scene. He's even wearing a pilgrim's hat and is having the satchel and having the, the shell. All these are indicators that um, if you are a pilgrim, that you are being like Christ, or Christ is. I guess it's the other way around. The Christ is being like you. All right, now that so that's the story being told, and that's the you know the, the the iconography of the thing. But look at the the way the figures are rendered, um, even though they're large and they're and they're sculptural, and they're in a kind of architectural context with a a, a semicircular arch and and uh, classical columns. So that's about as far as the classicism goes here. The the rendering of figures is 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 much more. Uh, uh, stylized and rendered like uh, the kind of things that we've seen before that are far from naturalistic. The uh, the artist has rendered figures as if they have no bones inside them. There's no shoulders, for example. The size of the head relationship to the body is not proportioned in the classical proportions. The way figures look, like the, the way the legs, the proportion of the legs, the this, this roundness of everything is even down to the fingers, look at the fingers. Uh, you know, they, they have no bones in them. It's because the, the artist is not looking at underlying structures inside these people. He's just using them as an excuse to make these forms, like the, these large curving forms that do this, that are really pointing. You know, they're pointing to Christ. It's, this pose, is the purpose is to point to Christ. And these little grooved edges to create the pattern is... Uh, you know, this emphasis on pattern is a Byzantine thing as we've seen before, but it's also, you know, emphasized in the, uh, you know, this being the Western part of Europe, those uh, portable jewelry things that we've seen in the Hyperno-Saxon medieval manuscript illuminations, they, they also have this emphasis on patterns. So whichever, whichever influence was the one who, that, that came to, to, to be this is you know doesn't matter. It's going to be it's going to be one or the other or or a blend of both of them, and and very little indication that the person has seen classical classical uh, sculpture. Uh, these these figures are sort of cartoon like. They're they're not rendered at all like anything from from classical antiquity. There's patterns in the hair, patterns in the beard, the 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 strange proportions of the face uh, are 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 just like unique to this artist. Uh, because they're not like anything else, uh, and when you when things are stylized, they can be much different from from one another. Whereas if things are naturalistic, things no matter when they're made, they they have a family resemblance to one another. Because anything that is like nature, you know, nature stays the same. People people look look the same if they're rendered naturalistically. So any things that are made in the Renaissance look very much like things that were made in classical antiquity. And the same, same, similarly with things made in the Baroque or even the Neoclassical period. Now, those are periods where naturalism was 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 in fashion. In fashion, um, faces look the same. But here, uh, when you have a time when many different artists are doing or stylizing faces and stylizing figures, uh, they make them, you know, anyway. And this is this is a, this is strange. We don't, we've never seen one with this kind of nose, this kind of head. Uh, this is this is new. Here's another image from the uh, that same place. You can see how figures are, are rendered similarly 
with a kind of distortion here, Christ is, is made much larger uh, than the other disciples. This is the doubting Thomas, and he is reaching out to touch Christ's wound uh, to clarify that it's really Christ. But you know, when you look at this in relationship to the way things actually look in the real world, it, we, we are we are very far removed. And the the artist who's who's making these things is removing them from the real world by doing this style. And there's this odd circumstance of having to show uh, the anatomy of Christ's body, you know, for a moment to show to tell this story. You know, it's as if he didn't have really a language for. Uh, for anatomy, he had to make something, some think things up. So he used the ribs as an opportunity to make some patterns uh, here. All right, let's look at another Romanesque building, and this one is in Pisa. It has the Leaning Tower of Pisa. This is the church, uh, the main, uh, the main church in Pisa, the Duomo. It's called, and in in Pisa, when they were making their church, uh, they had access. Uh, an even greater access to uh, classical antiquity because it being in Italy, um, they were much closer to actual Roman buildings and Roman ruins that, that existed and, and they were much more common. So when people in Spain say, uh, as we saw, you know, when they are doing something in the Romanesque manner, you know, they have a few things that, that indicate that they've seen some Roman things. But here, this kind of thing, all these, all these columns. These these columns may actually have come from from Roman built, real Roman buildings. Like they're, they look like they're different colors, so that they were, you know, they were taken from something that were actually Roman, uh, maybe the capitals at least. And and this kind of arcade that you see that's decorating this building, is is very close to something that you would see in classical antiquity. So that they're uh, they're using forms that are much more familiar to them. Even the shape of the building, the uh, uh, this 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 box shape with a, a pediment. If you can imagine this pediment, if that were to continue, would be sort of like a Greek temple front facade. And uh, we're we're only blocking it with this shape, with another sort of Greek temple front facade, because Christian churches are basilicas with a nave here, and this has to represent the nave shape and the aisle shape over here. So it's they're sort of compromising between the actual church basilican shape and what used to be uh, the Greek uh, temple front facade, and having lots and lots of columns. These are, uh, you know, sort of in reference to the the temple front, which would normally have just a few columns here, you know, large columns in the front. But having this this small pattern kind of looks, I don't know, Byzantine you know, to to reducing what would be classical forms to small and putting a lot of them and repeating it a lot of times uh, is a kind of a Byzantine thing to do. So again, we're, we're, we're looking at a blend, you know, Byzantine patterns and decoration and uh, classical forms. And their classical forms are closer in spirit to real classical forms because this is made in in, uh, in Italy, where the classical forms are, are much more common. This is the interior of that church, and even though it's Romanesque, it doesn't have the, the barrel vaulted thing as we saw before, uh, but otherwise it, it has, you know, classical looking uh, uh, arcade down the, down the aisles, and also the similar artic articulation that we saw in the Spanish church. All right, let's look at the uh, then an example of Romanesque sculpture uh, that has a much greater emphasis on on classical antiquity than than we than we saw before. The one we saw from Spain was was very far removed, and here this is this the uh, emphasis is is more on the on the classical. This is a a, a bronze baptistry in what is now Belgium, and it's by we have the the name. Uh, uh, Renier de Huy, uh, H U Y, and he, this this is made by somebody who had access apparently to actual uh, classical imagery. Because when you look at the figures, this is John baptizing Christ, and there's other figures here, other baptiz uh, baptiz baptisms that are going on. Uh, 
angels are here holding towels ready to take to dry off Christ when he comes out of the water. Uh, it's not entirely classical, but if you look at this figure, it does seem to have the same sort of proportions that a classical figure has. It has a cloth around it, and that cloth is moving the way cloth actually moves. He's, you can see this is a hand here. Let me, let me go to a, a different picture. Here's another picture. The hand is, is cinching the cloth right here, and all these little um, lines indicate that the cloth is, is behaving the way cloth actually behaves. You can only do this if you've looked at the real world and seen the way actual cloth moves, and or if you've seen instances of it in, a, in some, some classical instance where that artist was looking at an actual thing. Look at this figure back here where you can see the back. The proportions of this figure are you know not entirely classical, but pretty close or relatively close compared to what we've seen before. Uh, the hairstyle kind of kind of classical. The fact that the, the musculature is not it doesn't have a lot of detail, but it has enough to tell you that you know this looks like um, we're in the classical world a little more than, than before. Just the way the, the, the cloth goes over the body, this little this little curve right here to indicate you know, the, the shape is, is going around the forms, even going around the legs. This foot seems to be stuck onto the ground, and like there's, the, like there's weight uh, involved in the shape of the, the body and the way the weight distribution is affecting how the body looks. All those are classical things. Uh, this angel, um, we seem to be seeing it in a, a three-quarter view, where there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an arm back here in space, and there's one forward. There's, there's little grooves that indicate the, the shape of the, 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 of the cloth is going underneath here and, and going, continuing over here, so that we have, we have some spatial relationships here. This, the, the, this cloth looks like it's being held in space, space with uh, this arm further back and this one closer to us. And you know it's it's clear the space is more clear and 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 uh, you know these are all classical features. This wing going this way is 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 naturally in space, but this one going over here doesn't fit that same pattern. In fact, everything doesn't fit the pattern of being classical. Look at the the halos. The halos are on the surface here rather than on the backs of their heads. If you remember, if I go back. Um, to an earlier thing we were seeing before, this halo is not on the on the surface, but attached to the back of uh, God the Father's head. So it's so it's it's actually in space with the head. So that you know, if, if we're looking for classical things about this, which we're, we were hard pressed to find any, I guess that might be one. And if we were looking for things that are not classical about this, it would be the fact that the the halos are discs attached to the surface. Um, here's another thing. This is supposed to be water. This is, this is Christ immersed in water in the River Jordan. And when you think about it, you know, how if, if, if the artist continued to use the same classicism that he's using in the figures, use it in, the, in, the, in this image of the water, well, that would be difficult to do. I mean, that would, that would require a spatial rendering beyond, I imagine, what, what this artist was capable of, or at least within the context of this scene. So he uses a symbol, uh, this little pile here with the you know, wavy lines to indicate, okay, we're, we're pretending that this is water. Otherwise, you know, most everything seems to be very clear and naturalistic. Um, this, this, this tree is a little, little more real than that St. Michael's Hildesheim uh, uh, bronze doors that we were seeing. Up here is God the Father sticking his head through uh, a kind of a, a glory rainbowy kind of thing going on here with his with his halo seem, seemingly uh, against you know moving in space with him. This is the Holy Spirit as we see this is the word Pater up here for God the Father P-A-T-E-R. Um, this is the abbreviation for Spiritus Sanctus here and, and these are the words uttered by uh, John, uh, well, by God the Father, saying, this is my beloved son, this is this, and is, and Phileus is son, and uh, um, with whom I'm well pleased, and over here is I baptize you, ego is, is, is I, and there's the word baptize, you can read it very clearly, because these are 
um, classical letters, you know, like Roman inscription letters, so it's easy to read. Another thing is these oxen here, they seem to be holding up the basin, and this is a reference to uh, the biblical description of the uh, um, um, part of the church furniture inside the temple of Solomon. I guess it wouldn't be church furniture, it'd be temple furniture. But the, the, they're, they're oxen that are holding up a basin in the, in the, in the temple of Solomon. And, and so uh, to make this a Christian version of this, they make 12 oxen, so to represent the 12, uh, the 12 disciples, say, or the 12, uh, uh, what else is 12? The, the 12 months of the year, the 12 uh, uh, tribes of, of, of Israel, um, there's lots of twelves, uh, and also numerically it has to do with baptism, the twelve, and there's also, there's probably some eights and six in here that has also have to do with, with, uh, with baptism, baptism as well. Okay, so this, that's Romanesque sculpture, and as we see, this blend is greater on the side of the, uh, of classicism compared to what we were seeing before, here, which is more on the side of the, uh, I guess we call it the barbaric style or the tetrarch style or the Byzantine style, the, the non-classical style, uh, though they each have elements of, of both or a blending of, 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 of both. Okay, so that, that concludes the, the Romanesque period. Well, well, we're going to look a little bit more later in the next one uh, for with the Bayou Tapestry.